Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today we're having a look at some fascinating relics of the Cold War that you may have actually come across at one point or another without even realizing it. These are commercial AM radios manufactured between 1953 and 1963. And I know this not because I checked the serial number, but because all of them bear some very distinctive markings. So if we look at this Philco radio right here, you'll see on the dial there are two very unusual symbols, a triangle with the letters CD. Now, those of you who've been following the channel for a while will immediately recognize that as the logo of Civil Defense, which was an organization formed during the Cold War to prepare the civilian population for and protect them in the wake of a nuclear attack. Now, the idea here is that these two symbols mark the frequencies 640 and 1240 kilohertz. And in the event of a nuclear attack, you could turn to either of those frequencies in order to receive news and civil defense instructions from the government. And this was part of a much larger system known as CONELRAD, which stood for Control of Electronic Radiation. So this was originally known as the Key Station System and was first implemented on December 10th, 1951. Now the idea behind Colonel Rad was to allow the US president and the US government more broadly to reach as many American citizens as possible as quickly as possible in the event of a national emergency such as a nuclear attack. And the system consisted of a number of commercial broadcast stations designated as key stations as well as a larger number of subsidiary relay stations. And when they received an alert from the government, the key stations would then transmit an activation signal. And this consisted of shutting the transmitter off for five seconds, turning it back on again for five seconds, shutting it off again for five seconds, then turning it back on and broadcasting a 1000 Hertz tone for 15 seconds. And upon receiving this activation signal, the relay stations would stop their regular programming and switch transmission over to either 640 or 1240 kHz and await further instructions. Meanwhile, any station that wasn't part of the system would shut down so as not to pollute the airwaves with extraneous broadcasts. And because at that time, as today, there were a lot of amateur radio stations all across the country, uh, radio amateurs could actually buy a Conal Rad detection unit from companies like Heathkit, which could connect to their transmitter, and upon receiving a Conal Rad activation signal, would automatically shut off the transmitter. And now, once the system was activated, the government could broadcast news and civil defense instructions to anybody who could tune into those two stations. And to ensure that as many people had access to Conal Rad as possible, all radios sold in the United States between 1953 and 1963 were required by law to have those two stations, 640 and 1240 kilohertz, marked on their dials. Now, most radios didn't have the full civil defense logo like this one. Usually they were a lot more simple, such as on this Electrohome radio here, where it takes the form of a circle in a triangle. But more often than not, it was just a simple triangle, such as on this Hitachi transistor radio. Now, another major component of Conal Rad was a system that switched the broadcast duties between multiple different stations in sequential order. And the idea here was to deny incoming Soviet bombers a homing beacon which they could use to locate their targets. Now, all of this sounds fairly straightforward in theory, but unfortunately, in practice, Conal Rad turned out to have some pretty severe flaws, as evidenced by a pair of rather embarrassing false alarms that took place in the mid to late 50s. So the first of these incidents took place on May 5th, 1955, and was triggered by a Canadian air defense radar detecting what it believed to be an incoming flight of Soviet bombers. In response, Continental Air Defense Command, Western Division, sounded the alarm and attempted to activate the Conal Rad system. The results were utter chaos because it turned out that most of the participant stations either hadn't been trained very well or were so out of practice they had absolutely no idea what to do. Most of them didn't even respond. They didn't stop broadcasting. They didn't switch over to the two designated frequencies. Only around 20% of the entire system actually activated and the whole alert was called off after about 10 minutes when it was determined that the incoming contact was not in fact Soviet bombers, but rather a flight of American B-47 Stratojets on a routine training exercise. 
So the next false alarm took place on November 5th, 1959, and in this case was triggered by a miscommunication. So Air Defense Command was attempting to send a routine communications check signal, but instead of sending the correct signal, which was this is an air defense line check, they instead sent this is an air defense radio alert. And this caused a radio station called WJPG covering northern Wisconsin and Michigan to activate the Conelrad system. But yet again, most of these subsidiary relay stations didn't know what to do with the alert, and only a small percentage of them actually went through the procedure correctly. It was utter chaos, and once again showed the significant shortcomings of the Conelrad system. Now, another major flaw with Conelrad, which you could consider to be a rather fundamental flaw, was that you needed to know already that there was an attack taking place in order to know to switch to one of the two designated frequencies and get information. There was no way of reaching people who weren't already tuned in or didn't already know what was going on. Uh, also, the round-robin switching system that was supposed to stop Soviet bombers from homing in on targets was pretty useless because the relay stations were typically clustered around a small area around the key stations, meaning that despite the switching, a Soviet bomber could still have used the system to home in on large targets like cities. And for this and many other reasons, Konolrad was finally phased out and replaced in 1963. So between 1956 and 1963, the U.S. government attempted to introduce a replacement for Konolrad known as the National Emergency Alarm Repeater, or NEAR. And this is a rather clever little device that didn't rely on radio reception to get its alert signal, but rather could be plugged directly into a regular household outlet and received its signal instead through the electrical mains by modulating the alternating current coming through it. And so you didn't actually need to be tuned in to receive a signal. You could receive an alert signal no matter what you were doing, so long as your house was receiving electricity, which was a major advantage over Konolrad. However, this was also the system's Achilles heel due to the fragility of the national electrical grid. The electricity could easily be knocked out by either a nuclear weapon detonating near a power station or a substation or other electrical infrastructure, or by the electromagnetic pulse generated by a high-altitude nuclear detonation. And for this reason and others, the NEAR program was eventually cancelled, all units were ordered destroyed, and Konolrad was instead replaced on August 5th, 1963, by the Emergency Broadcast System, or EBS. So in many ways, EBS was very similar to Konolrad, only instead of designating specific frequencies for emergency broadcasts, the system took over the entire national broadcast network and used the same frequencies that would normally be used to transmit regular commercial programming. So under this system, an alert could originate with either Aerospace Defense Command or the Federal Preparedness Agency and they would transmit what was known as an Emergency Activation Notice, or EAN, via the Associated Press or United Press Wire Services, via teletype. And this alert consisted of a series of Xs across the page on the teletype, followed by the teletype bell ringing certain number of times. And this would inform a broadcaster that an alert was forthcoming. The government would then send out a set of test authenticator words, and every broadcaster was required to have a special envelope which had code words printed on the outside and another set of code words on an envelope sealed inside. And they would have to compare the words on the outside of the envelope to the ones being received by teletype. And if any of them didn't match, they would then open the envelope and compare the words inside and translate the message being relayed. They would then terminate all regular programming and transmit the appropriate emergency message over their regular broadcast frequencies. Now, to avoid the complacency and lack of training that had plagued the Konolrad system, broadcasters were required to conduct a test of the emergency broadcast system once a week between the hours of 8.30 a.m. and local sunset. Now, most broadcasters scheduled this during hours of low viewership to avoid annoying their viewers. Now, originally, the activation signal that was broadcast out was the same as Konolrad, turning the transmitter off for 5 seconds, on for 5 seconds, off for 5 seconds, back on and transmitting a 1000 Hz tone. 
Unfortunately, however, a lot of transmitters couldn't take this power cycling and tended to just shut off. Thus, this procedure became known jokingly as the EBS stress test. Now, because knocking a bunch of the transmitters in your system offline is not an ideal situation, in 1970, this procedure was replaced by a new alert tone consisting of the frequencies 853 and 960 hertz mixed together. This was chosen specifically because of its unpleasantness to the human ear. And this is the infamous emergency broadcast system screech that has been parodied many, many times. This is a test. This station is conducting a test of the emergency broadcasting system. This is only a test. This is a test of the emergency broadcasting system. The broadcasters of your area, in voluntary cooperation with federal, state, and local authorities, have developed this system to keep you informed in the event of an emergency. If this had been an actual emergency, the attention signal you've just heard would have been followed by official information, news, or instructions. This station serves the Northeast Illinois area. This concludes this test of the emergency broadcast system. Now, once again, all of this seems fairly straightforward in theory and a great improvement over Conalrad. However, in practice, EBS also turned out to have some pretty gaping flaws, uh, which were laid bare during a false alarm incident that took place on February 20th 1971. Now this particular alert was triggered by one W.S. Eberhardt, a teletype operator for the government, and he actually mixed up the tapes containing all the various authenticator code words that day and ended up sending out the wrong code word, in this case, hatefulness. And because this didn't match the words on the outside of the envelopes issued for that day, a lot of broadcast stations started the activation procedure for the emergency broadcast system. 25 before 10. Doesn't somebody want to be wanted? The Partridge family. This station has interrupted its regular program at the request of the United States government to participate in the emergency broadcast system serving the Fort Wayne area. During this period, many radio stations will remain on the air, broadcasting news and official information for areas assigned to them. WOWO received this emergency announcement just moments ago. We have to verify, we did verify, with a special message in code, and this is an emergency action directed by the emergency network and directed by the president. And this alert lasted for 40 minutes because Eberhardt kept screwing up the termination signal. He kept in writing in the wrong word. And it took him six unsuccessful tries before he was finally able to shut the alert down. Now, if that was it, then that would have been fine. It would have been a great test of the system. But as it turned out, just as with Conalrad, most of the stations had absolutely no idea what to do with this alert. And only around 20% actually activated the EBS as per the proper procedure. Not a good look. And so in the wake of this incident, EBS tests were temporarily suspended, not returning to the airwaves until two years later in December 1972. And when the system was finally reactivated, there were a couple of changes made to the overall procedure. First, the emergency activation notices would be sent through the news desks of the various wire services, as well as the White House Information Office for vetting. And this introduced a one minute delay to the notice reaching the public. Also, in the original system, there were two different messages, one for a more general alert and one for a specific alert. Because the specific alert was thought to cause far too much panic, only the general alert was kept. And finally, government broadcast stations were ordered to keep the tapes with the authenticator words away from the transmitter to avoid a repeat of the 1971 incident. Yet despite these improvements, it was soon realized that not only was EBS deeply flawed, but it was also somewhat redundant given developments in broadcast technology and culture. As Kurt Beckman of WCCOAM stated in a 1984 interview, I'll tell you why it probably wouldn't work, because if the president has a national emergency, he will call in the national radio and television networks and presto, he will communicate with us. If those networks are somehow incapacitated and he has to go to the EBS as a backup, 
it's inconceivable that the rest of us will be up and running if the networks aren't up and running. Nonetheless, EBS remained in service until January 1st, 1997, when it was replaced by the Emergency Alert System, or EAS. And EAS is roughly similar to EBS, only it uses a system of digitally encoded headers known as SAME, or Specific Area Message Encoding, in order to route a message to a specific relevant area. And so the system can be used not only for national level emergencies, such as nuclear war, but also local emergencies, such as natural disasters. The system comprises 77 national primary stations, also known as primary entry points, or PEPs, scattered across the country, which can be used to transmit both local and national emergency alerts. And these alerts are triggered by the various digital SAME headers, the most serious of which is known as the Emergency Alert Notification, or National Emergency Message, and this indicates that the U.S. President will speak to the nation within 10 minutes. Now, this can be deactivated in one of two ways. One is an End of Message, or EOM, notification, which allows the station to stop broadcasting the address from the President, but does not allow them to return to ordinary broadcasting. They have to await orders. Then finally, there is the Emergency Alert Termination, or EAT, which cancels the entire alert and allows stations to go back to regular broadcasting. Now, in June 2006, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, EAS was integrated into a larger system known as the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, or IPAWS. And this consists not only of EAS, but the National Warning System, or NAWAS, which is basically a 2,200 phone party line that connects state emergency operations centers and National Weather Service field offices. And this allows alerts and information on severe weather events and other natural disasters to be quickly and efficiently transmitted. It also includes the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, Weather Radio All Hazard System. And these alerts are received using special radios that are a common sight in areas prone to severe weather, such as Tornado Alley. And finally, IPAWS includes the Wireless Emergency Alerts, or WEA system, which was implemented in 2008 and sends out national emergency alerts via text message. Now you're probably familiar with the WEA system from the January 13th, 2018 false alarm incident in which the residents of Hawaii received a rather disturbing text message indicating that the islands were under missile attack. So that is the state of national emergency broadcast infrastructure in the United States today. And although IPAWS is a very comprehensive system, many have argued that just like EBS before it, it is fairly redundant due to the 24 hour news cycle, which means that most people will learn about a local or national emergency long before IPAWS kicks in. But Although all of the systems that we've discussed in North America throughout the Cold War have been fairly inefficient and flawed, at the very least, we had the luxury of long warning times for nuclear attack. So, for example, in the early part of the Cold War, when nuclear weapons could only be delivered by manned bombers, the warning time between a bomber being detected by radar, such as the Distant Early Warning or Dew Line, and them actually reaching a populated center was measured in hours. Whereas in the ICBM era, the minimum warning time for an ICBM launched from the Soviet Union to reach North America was around 30 minutes. However, the UK and the rest of Western Europe didn't have this luxury. Due to their proximity to the Soviet Union, their warning time of a bomber or missile attack was measured in mere minutes. In the case of the UK, four minutes, and so they were forced to develop a series of sophisticated alert systems in order to warn as many people as possible within that very narrow window. And one of these was called, appropriately enough, the four-minute warning. And this was integrated to the national telephone network and transmitted emergency alerts by the same system as the speaking clock. And when this was activated, this would turn on a system of 7,000 air raid sirens all across the country. Though in many rural areas where sirens couldn't be installed, the alert went to the local police station and a police officer would have to use a hand crank siren, church bells, or other means of spreading the alert. 
There was also a system called Handel, which was in use from 1962 to 1992. And this consisted of two parts. There was the Handel 1A transmitter, which was housed in the UK Warning and Monitoring Organization, or UKWMO headquarters in Oxford, and thousands of WB1400 receiver sets scattered across the country. And the Handel device could receive one of four standard warnings. An imminent attack was signaled by a warbling sound and the words attack warning red. Imminent fallout was signaled by a high-pitched pip and the words fallout warning black. Fallout expected within the hour, which was a signal for outlying areas far away from primary nuclear targets, was signaled by another high-pitched pip and attack warning gray, while the all-clear was also signaled by a high-pitched pip, followed by attack warning white. And if you want to see this device in action, I would highly recommend you check out the 1984 British television film Threads, which is the most realistic and utterly disturbing depiction of the aftermath of a nuclear war ever put on screen. I guarantee you that this movie will give you nightmares. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video despite the rather dark subject matter. And now hopefully you'll be able to go into an antique store or a flea market and spot Conal Rad equipped radios and maybe buy one for yourself as a curious memento of the Cold War. Now I'll see you next time on another video on our own devices where we'll look at yet more fascinating devices just like these. Until then, I'm Jean Messier. Have a great day.